anybody to have to do. I don't care who you are. Had the men responsible been living among them all along? In my gut feeling, I knew they had done something with her. They had hurt her in some way. They've hunted just about everything there was to hunt, including the ultimate human hunt. They are serial killers that will kill randomly. They're the worst kind of serial killer. Every chance she gets, Kim Rage Vanderheiden searches this wooded terrain in California's Central Valley. She's looking for some sign of her sister Cindy. 25-year-old Cindy Vanderheiden vanished without a trace in 1998. Police believe her body was buried somewhere in the area. Even to this day, I have this glimmer of hope, I think, stuck way back in my subconscious, that I'll find her and I'll bring her home and everything will be the same as it was before. Raymond and Paula Wheeler's daughter, Chevy, disappeared in 1985. For years, they too have scoured the Central Valley for any clue to her whereabouts. We keep on looking, traveling, looking, searching, asking questions, nobody knows anything. At first, the Wheelers and the Vanderheidens were only linked by their shared sorrow. Then, in 1998, their daughter's tragic stories became intertwined. That year, Cindy Vanderheiden was living with her parents in San Joaquin County, California. Many here in the state's central valley trace their roots to the 1930s migration of the Okies. Midwestern farmers fleeing the Dust Bowl. Today, the area is known for orchards, vineyards, and livestock, and is tied together by hard-working people and close-knit communities. But there is a darker fringe element. As you get into, say, the foothills, you're looking into a more drug-infested world. There's a lot of methamphetamines up there, a lot of cooking of dope, as a young woman, Cindy Vanderheiden had tried drugs, but had since given them up. Wanting to stay clean and get her life together, she moved back home with her parents. By the fall of 1998, Cindy was working as a computer operator and had just bought a new car, which she spent endless hours washing and waxing. Her father was proud that his daughter was now on the right track. She was real happy. And she was really happy with the work, and the people really liked her at work, and she just had big plans of just going right on along. She spent a lot of time with my parents. She didn't really go out on dates that much. Her relaxing time was sunbathing or just hanging out with her cat and her nieces. On the afternoon of November 14th, John Vander Heiden was driving about a mile away from his home when he noticed something odd. His daughter's new car was parked next to the local cemetery. Naturally, I turned around, went back up and looked, and it looked like it was all locked up. And then I came back and I asked my wife, where's Cindy at, you know? And she said, well, she's supposed to be at work. Her parents had thought that Cindy came home late the night before and left for work before they awoke. But when Mr. Vander Heiden called his daughter's office, he learned that she hadn't shown up that morning. He went back to the cemetery to examine her car more closely. We got the spare key, so I put the key in. I was going to open the door, but found it was already unlocked. When my husband said that he found her car and there was no... her purse and everything was in it, I was real afraid. I know Cindy would not have ever left her car unlocked and her purse in her car. That evening, the Vander Heidens called the county sheriff's office. Detective Deborah Scheffel was assigned the case. The cemetery driveway itself uh, sh didn't show any signs of struggle or there was no blood. There was nothing other than the, just a car parked and Cindy was gone.
Over the next few days, the Vander Heidens made repeated public pleas for information about Cindy. They were convinced she would not have left without telling anyone and feared she had been the victim of foul play. She would not do this. Not, not my Cindy. Cindy wouldn't. Not, not. Somebody took her and hurt her. Or I hope they didn't hurt her. But. Find some way, Cindy, to, to, to get back to us. Uh, I'll come and get you. Soon the area was blanketed with posters and signs. The community also came together to form a search party. I think we had about five or 600 people show up. We had horses, dogs, canoes. I mean, it was quite an extensive search for within a 50 mile radius and nothing. Cindy had last been seen at a bar called the Linden Inn. Police interviewed anyone who had come into contact with her that night. Nearly all of them cooperated and had alibis that checked out. Two did not. One was 32-year-old Lauren Herzog. The Vander Heiden family knew Herzog. He'd once had a brief affair with Cindy's older sister, Kim. When I first started dating him, he gained my trust, of course. He was a protector. I could, it was hard for me to believe that he would let something happen to Cindy. The other man was a friend of Herzog's and an acquaintance of Cindy Vander Heiden's. Wesley Shermantine, also 32. Though he was married and the father of two young boys, Shermantine nevertheless had a reputation as a barroom brawler. He had a history of being intimidating. He had a penchant for the sucker punch. He'd walk up to you in a bar and lay you out in one punch. Shermantine and Herzog had grown up across the road from each other in the town of Linden. Lauren told me one time there wasn't many folks to play with out there. You kind of had to play with whoever was nearby because it was such a rural area. They introduced themselves as brother. They ran like brothers. They acted like brothers in the protection aspect and everything. They'd lie for each other like brothers. The friends shared a love of hunting and fishing. As they got older, they spent much of their time in bars and began using methamphetamine, commonly called crank or speed. They knew where to get it at all times. I've seen them up for three or four days at a time, and they're scary. Their demeanor changes. They're both mean, but in their own ways. As investigators dug deeper into the background of the two men, they found something more ominous than a few barroom fistfights. Thirteen years earlier, Wesley Shermantine had been a suspect in the disappearance of another young woman, a Stockton, California teenager named Chevy Wheeler. He had never been charged, and the case had never been solved. Shermantine's name had now come up in two missing persons cases, and Detective Scheffel was convinced that this was no coincidence. When you realize that someone like Wes Shermantine has crossed the path of your victim, it, you have to take a good hard look at the possibility that they are involved. I got the case Sunday morning, and by Sunday evening, I knew that I was going to need to find him. In November 1998, the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Department was investigating the disappearance of 25-year-old Cindy Vander Heiden. Detective Deborah Scheffel was the lead investigator on the case. When I first got it, I thought, well, most of these things usually resolve within 24 to 48 hours, and the person is brought home safely, and there's an explanation. This one, however, was far different. The night she disappeared, Cindy had been seen with two men she knew, Wes Shermantine and Lauren Herzog, a friend of her sister Kim. Detective Shuffle convinced Shermantine to meet her at a local restaurant on Monday, November 16th, two days after Cindy's disappearance. Shuffle taped their conversation. And for identification purposes, we'll identify by voice. Just say your name. Wesley Howard Shermantine. Shermantine told the officers that he and Lauren Herzog had spent that evening at a bar called the Linden Inn. Shermantine denied speaking to Cindy Vanderheiden or even knowing her. 
she and never spoke to me. She never spoke to you. Never spoke. So to the me. people that say that she was talking to you and Lauren are lying. Well, no, they got me confused because I don't know Cindy. Like Sherman Tyne, Lauren Herzog told police he had no knowledge of Cindy Vander Heiden's whereabouts. By now, County Prosecutor Thomas Testa had learned that the Sheriff's Office was investigating Wesley Sherman Tyne. It was a name Testa knew well. Thirteen years earlier, in 1985, Sherman Tyne had been linked to the disappearance of a Stockton, California teenager named Chevy Wheeler. As soon as I learned that Cindy Vander Heiden disappeared and was last seen talking to Wes Sherman Tyne, it was a bombshell. Steve Kniff had been the lead investigator in the Wheeler case. My feeling from the beginning was that Mr. Sherman Tyne was responsible for Chevy's disappearance and probably her death. Chevelle Wheeler, known to friends and family as Chevy, was 16 in 1985, a junior at Franklin High School. She hadn't been a diligent student, but was talking about taking school more seriously. She was going to graduate with her class and get good grades and have her car and, you know, the whole nine yards, go to college and stuff, and she swore up and down she was going to start anew. Chevy had met 19-year-old Wes Shermantine through a mutual acquaintance. They had only been friends for a few months. Her parents did not approve of their relationship. The guy was no good. There was just something in his eyes that I just didn't like, period. Uh, his eyes were dead. You know, there was nothing in them whatsoever. Just as blank as you can get. After seeing a handgun on the floor of Shermantine's truck, Chevy's father tried to stop his daughter from ever seeing Sherman Tyne again. I says, what the hell are you doing with a gun? He says, oh, that's for protection. I says, you mean as young and as big as you are, you need protection? I told Chevy, don't be around this guy. He's no good, you know. But uh, like all teenagers, they make bad decisions. Well, we all do. On the morning of October 7th, 1985, Chevy was getting ready for school when her younger sister Marnie told her that Wesley Shermantine was on the phone. After talking to him for a while, Chevy told her sister that she was going to leave school early and go for a drive with Wes. She asked Marnie to cover for her. Chevy had her mother drive her to school just as she always did. I dropped her off and she got out of the car and says, Bye, Mom, I love you. And I'll call you too. And she waved goodbye. And went off to school. Chevy Wheeler never returned home. That evening, when her parents learned that she'd skipped classes to go driving with Wesley Sherman time, they feared the worst. It felt like I had a heart attack. You know, it's like somebody just took a knife and stuck it in my heart because I knew the guy was evil. In addition to calling police, the terrified parents tried to track Shermantine down on their own. I called every Shermantine in the book. Nobody knew, nobody heard of him, nobody wanted to admit that they knew him. The next morning, though, Wesley Shermantine showed up at the Wheeler's home. He said that he'd heard that I was looking for him and that he hadn't seen her since uh, the summer. He didn't know anything about it. A few days later, Stockton police questioned Sherman Tyne about his activities on the day Chevy disappeared. His alibi was that he left his home in Linden uh, about four or five in the morning, and that he went deer hunting, and that he was deer hunting all day, and that he returned home after dark. Kniff obtained a search warrant for Sherman Tyne's parents' hunting cabin in the foothills about 40 miles from Stockton. There, investigators found traces of human blood throughout the cabin. At the time, forensic testing could determine what type of blood had been recovered, but could not match it to any specific person. Chevy Wheeler was a negative, as were the samples from the cabin. But the blood could not prove conclusively that Chevy had been there. Turns out the Germantines were a type blood, too. They found some long blonde hair, but his sister had long blonde hair too. 
So, you know, there, there was no tie-in proof, you know, that, that she had been there. It was compelling enough to us, but it wasn't compelling enough to take to a jury to convict Mr. Shermantine. And uh, so the investigation just kind of slowly came to a standstill. She was my firstborn, and the thought of not knowing where she was, if she was alive, it's heartbreaking. Most frustrating for the family was their belief that Shermantine was somehow involved in what happened to Chevy. I knew all along that, that he was. There was no question about it, no, no question at all. For nearly 13 years, the case lay dormant. But by the late 1990s, police had a new weapon in their arsenal, DNA testing. In the summer of 1998, Stockton authorities began reopening cold cases including Chevy Wheeler's. The 13-year-old blood evidence was submitted for DNA testing. Preliminary results showed that the blood in Shermantine's cabin was probably Chevy's. But at the time, the district attorney felt that that particular type of testing that had been used was not sufficiently court qualified to look at a prosecution. The samples were resubmitted to the state crime lab for more definitive testing, a process that would take weeks. It was during the wait for these new results on November 14, 1998, that Cindy Vanderheiden disappeared. Wesley Sherman Tyne was now linked to two missing persons cases. The tragic loss of both their daughters brought the Vanderheiden and the Wheeler families together. I offered to the Wheelers that, you know, I'm supporting you 100%. If you need anything, let's just bring both girls home. But by early December 1998, Cindy had been gone nearly a month, and the investigation had turned up no trace of her. The prime suspect remained Wes Shermantine, who had been with Cindy the night she disappeared. During the investigation, several witnesses had told police of hearing Shermantine brag about knowing how to get rid of a body. We interviewed quite a few people who Wes Shermantine made that kind of statement too, that if, you know, it would be so easy just to drop you down a mine shaft. And he's right, frighteningly easy. On December 10th, an exasperated detective shuffle spoke to an outraged Shermantine on the phone. Have something on me, you. arrest me. Otherwise, get off my family, get, get off my back. Now I'm tired of cooperating. I've been cooperating all along. Just getting be bullshit every the other o- week. The only call. thing, the only other thing I've asked you if to you do. If you have something, arrest me. The only other thing I ask. Otherwise, I'm gonna have my lawyer press charges for harassment. Then, in mid-January 1999, police finally got a break. Truman Tyne fell behind in his car payments, and his 1985 Toyota Cressida, the car he was driving the night Cindy disappeared, was repossessed. The dealership allowed the police to do a thorough search. We asked the Department of Justice criminalist to process the car for evidence. They discovered human blood in the trunk of the car, as well as on the post of the headrest in the car. Preliminary DNA tests indicated that the blood was indeed Cindy Vanderheiden's. It was the first physical evidence of any kind in the case. Police believed they had their men. But as in the Chevy Wheeler case, investigators would have to wait for final DNA testing to be completed before they could be absolutely certain. On January 28th, the suspect was brought in for questioning. So we have this situation 13 years ago. I mean, you're only 33 years old, Wes. 32. 32. And twice in your life, you're being questioned with regards to a missing female. I realize, you know, that's, I mean, what do you think about that? That's terrible. Okay, two times, Mm -hmm. you're only 32. And you flatly deny having any contact with Cindy Vanderheiden, either in conversation with her at the bar, you didn't talk to her. Never talked to her. Sherman Tyne didn't seem concerned by the fact that police had found blood in his car. So 
what you're saying is you're going to make us drag you into court with with the results of the blood that's in the trunk of your car? Yes. Because I don't know what I'm going to send you. January 1998, in California's Central Valley, 25-year-old Cindy Vander Heiden had been missing for two months. Increasingly desperate, her family offered a reward for any information about her whereabouts. $20,000 was pledged to find Cindy Vander Heiden. Cindy, if you're out there and you're afraid to come home, don't be, because I won't get mad. Please come home. Waiting for your child to come home is not something I would want anybody to have to do. I don't care who you are. And knowing deep down that what everybody tells you is that she probably won't be home is, uh, no, I couldn't handle it. 32-year-old Wesley Shermantine had been linked to the disappearance of another girl, Chevy Wheeler, 13 years before. And police believed DNA evidence would soon connect him to the missing Cindy Vanderheiden. While waiting for final test results, Police shifted their efforts to Shermantine's best friend, Lauren Herzog, who'd also been seen with Cindy Vander Heiden the night she disappeared. Sergeant Joseph Herrera was one of the officers on the case. It was discussion between investigators as to where was the possible weak, weakest link. At that point, it was determined it was time to turn our focus onto Lauren. Herzog, married with three children, was very different in temperament from the violent Shermantine. Lauren Herzog was a tall, humorous, easygoing, laid-back, polite, um, good old local boy. Good old Lauren Herzog. Herzog and Shermantine had developed a technique for picking up women in bars. I believe that Lauren would open the deals and Wes would close the deals. Lauren had the Bon Jovi rock and roll look, tall, trim guy and he would get the women to come over to the table and the bars, and then Wes would close the deals by taking out his drugs and uh, waving them and suggesting the, the group go somewhere. I would say Lauren is more of a follower, and Lauren would probably do what Wes said up to a certain point. Four months into the investigation, police convinced Herzog to provide them with blood and hair samples for DNA testing. On March 17th, officers went to his home to pick him up. There, with Herzog's parents and wife present, Sergeant Herrera applied some tactical pressure. I said, the investigation indicates that you are responsible for Cindy Vanderheide's disappearance. And either you killed her, those hands right there that you have, either killed Cindy Vanderheiden or you were just there and you knew what happened. If you killed her, don't talk to me. You get yourself a lawyer. I advise them to get in the car. Within a block or so, um, Lauren Herzog began to cry and said, what can I do to get out of this? At the station, Herzog waived his right to counsel and agreed to give a statement without an attorney. Start in front of the room you arrived at the bar? Yeah. He began to open up as he began to talk, and as time went on, there was almost a sense of relief once he was able to give his account of what occurred. Herzog told investigators that on the night of Friday the 13th, November 1998, he was at a local bar with Wes Shermantine. Cindy Vander Heiden approached them, wanting to know if they had any drugs. Herzog knew Cindy. He'd once dated her sister, Kim. Cindy wanted to go party. So, uh, she kind of talked to me and Wes. Kind of said, we're me. Herzog said that after the bar closed, he and Shermantine drove to the Glenview Cemetery to meet back up with Cindy. Maybe she was going to fall off the wagon. Who's to say? Nobody will ever know. She had been clean for eight months. And if she was going to fall off the wagon, she would trust Lauren enough to get it through him, and the cemetery would be the safest place for her to meet him. 
Herzog said they all sat in Shermantine's car and snorted lines of crank. Then Shermantine started the car and took off. While driving, Shermantine began demanding sex from Cindy. They struggled as the car sped down the dark road. Well, he starts telling her to do stuff, you know, and, and it's kind of a back and forth argument kind of thing. And I mean, do stuff as in uh, sexual acts, I guess that's what you draw. And he's getting wilder and wilder and wound up more and more. Finally, Herzog said, Shermantine stopped the car on an isolated farm road. There, he claimed Shermantine dragged Cindy Vanderheiden from the car, raped her, and then pulled out a knife. I heard a click. I knew what it was. And I started getting out of the car then. Just too late. He was a slack, slash and hacking, man. Huh? Herzog said that as he watched nearby, Wes Shermantine stabbed Cindy Vanderheiden to death. She, she was up. Herzog admitted that he then helped put Cindy's body in the trunk of Shermantine's car. He claimed not to know what Shermantine did with her after that. When detectives questioned Herzog about Chevy Wheeler, he said that Shermantine had admitted killing her. He also hinted that he knew Shermantine had committed other murders. You know, he told me once he killed 24 people or something. You know, it's like, I'm hoping that's both. I'm taking that to both. The next day, Sherman Tyne was arrested for Cindy Vander Heiden's murder. He told police nothing. But police continued to work on Lauren Herzog, who was now in custody. Detectives hoped to trick him into telling them what else he knew. They told Herzog that Sherman Tyne was implicating him in other murders. The first case they asked Herzog about was an unsolved 1984 double homicide which took place on Daggett Road on the outskirts of Stockton, California. A red truck similar to West Sherman Tynes had been seen in the area around the time of the murders. Herzog took the bait. He told police he had seen Sherman Tyne commit those murders as well. He had a charge car and started cheating. How many times do you think West shot totally? I think he did again because he used mine. Oh, really? <laughs> Eventually, Lauren Herzog admitted to witnessing Wesley Sherman Tyne commit a total of four additional killings. Paul Cavanaugh and Howard King, the unsolved 1984 double homicide. 41-year-old Henry Howell, shot in his car near Hope Valley, California in September 1984. And 24-year-old Robin Armtrout, whose nude body had been found on the bank of a creek a year later. Some of the statements he provided would have only been known by the killers themselves and by investigators, and the information was never let out to the public. In every instance, Herzog maintained that he was merely an innocent bystander, but he had no explanation for why he hadn't prevented the crimes. He never gave any excuse as to why he didn't stop this. There was never really any good answer that he provided or any I could recall that even made sense. Wes is up there shooting. Why didn't you? Why didn't I? I don't know. It's not right. Okay. I'm scared. Why didn't you shoot Wes? <laughs> I can't think of that. Good question. Why didn't I shoot Wes? Goddamn, I wish I would have.
In November 2000, 34-year-old Wesley Sherman Tyne went on trial in Central California for four murders, including those of Cindy Vanderheiden and Chevy Wheeler. Members of the victims' families made a point of attending the proceedings and confronting the accused. We were there every day, every minute of, of the trial, and he just sat there and looked. He couldn't care less. Cindy Vander Heiden's sister Kim hoped that the trial testimony might bring out some piece of information that could help her find her sister's body. My goal for showing up every day was how did I know a witness wouldn't slip up and say something? Give me a key answer of where to look. That was my main reason for going every day. During a videotaped interrogation, Wesley Shermantine's best friend, Lauren Herzog, had given police gruesome details of the defendant's alleged crimes. He was just like slashing and hacking, man. I mean, I knew what the clip was. It was a remarkable night, apparently. But in a pretrial ruling, the videotape had been ruled inadmissible as evidence. Deborah Fieldkowski was on the defense team. If you put in evidence against the defendant, he is entitled to counter that evidence, and that's usually through cross-examination. Well, you can't cross-examine a tape, so he'd be denied his right to confrontation. The trial began on November 21st. The case against Wesley Shermantine was 100% circumstantial. As I told the jurors, it was the number of small pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and the jurors had to put all of the puzzle pieces together and stand back and look at the puzzle, and then they could see what happened. Prosecutor Thomas Testa laid out the pieces one by one. Sherman Tyne's history of violence, his red truck spotted in the area of the crime scene, the blood found in his parents' hunting cabin, the blood found in his car, and so on. He actually outlined the case very well. He provided a kind of framework or an outline of what was going to happen chronologically, and it was very clear. The defense argued that the state's evidence left open the possibility that someone else had committed the murders. There were a lot of holes in the prosecution's case. We would be trying to show that those holes amounted to a reasonable doubt. The state's strongest case against Sherman Tyne was for the murder of Cindy Vanderheiden. DNA tests had confirmed that the blood found in Sherman Tyne's car belonged to the young woman. It had also been confirmed that the blood found in Sherman Tyne's cabin matched the DNA of Chevy Wheeler. The defense countered not by challenging the DNA evidence itself, but by challenging what it meant. In the Wheeler case, they pointed out that the evidence only proved that Chevy had been at Sherman Tyne's cabin, nothing else. Granted, it's her DNA, so it proves that she was in the cabin at some point, or at least her blood was in the cabin. The fact that she was in there doesn't necessarily mean that it was Wes who did anything to her. In the Vander Heiden case, they claimed that the DNA evidence found in Sherman Tyne's car did not contradict their theory that someone else could have committed the crime, including Lauren Herzog. Although it was Wes's car, Wes had always maintained that Lauren had borrowed his vehicle, and so that would explain why the blood was in the car. The whole strategy was just throw so much doubt and this is so far back and people's memories are not clear and, you know, just throw as much doubt in the air so that we don't have the pieces. On February 1st, 2001, after more than two months of testimony, the jury began its deliberations. It was a big effort that the jury had to decipher all or to interpret all the evidence, all the testimony, and to come up with what we think actually happened. On February 14th, the jury returned with their verdicts. For the families of the victims, the anticipation was almost unbearable. Chevy Wheeler's mother, Paula, had been waiting for this day for over 15 years. We were all holding hands, the Vander Heidens and us and I had several other family members. Wesley Sherman Tyne was found guilty of first-degree murder in all four cases. We just all, yes! You know, just held hands and yes. We got him. We got him. It was now up to the jury to decide if Sherman Tyne would be given life in prison or a death sentence. But before sentencing began, 
Prosecutor Thomas Testa offered Wesley Shermantine a deal in hopes of finding the location of Chevy Wheeler and Cindy Vanderheiden's bodies. If he would tell us where those bodies are and we could confirm they were the bodies that were missing, then we would not seek the death penalty. Shermantine told stunned prosecutors that they would have to give him the $20,000 reward that had been offered for information about the whereabouts of Cindy Vanderheiden. He claimed he wanted the money for his two young sons. The district attorney's office wanted no part of this deal. The victim's families, who controlled the reward money, also rejected the offer. If Shermantine wanted this money to take care of his kids, maybe he should have thought of that before he started killing in 1984. That's the way I looked at it. It was blood money. He was not going to get it. Shermantine didn't get his money, and the deal was off. The penalty phase of the trial began on February 21st, 2001. Before a packed and emotionally charged courtroom, Shermantine gave a statement proclaiming his innocence. You had people saying I put run somebody through a wood chipper, throwing them in mine shafts, burying them in rocks, burning them, throwing them in a quarry. Come on, where's all these people at? But I shouldn't have helped him kill Cindy and I didn't kill Chevy. Chevy was my friend. I never asked for no reward on Chevy. She wasn't your friend. Yes, she was my friend. On March 9, 2001, after deliberating for three days, the jury came back with its decision. Death. I just hope I live long enough to go see him, put to sleep like a dog. He doesn't deserve to breathe uh, for, for what he's done. I myself wish Shermantine would have got life instead of death. Because to me, it's worse to be life in prison than it is to be on death row. Five months later, Lauren Herzog was tried for the murders of five people, including Cindy Vanderheiden. His videotaped confession, ruled inadmissible at Shermantine's trial, was admitted at his own trial. He said, nothing good in the car. Does he yell at you? Yeah. Did you help him? Yeah. Herzog's confession placed him at the scene of the crimes and prosecutors argued that he was more than just an innocent bystander. At the Daggett Road killings, Lauren says, Wes killed these guys. Wes did it all, I just stood by. But when you take apart the evidence and look at those photos, you see that the angles of the shots, the weight of these men, the distances they were dragged, it was very likely there were two shooters. On October 23rd, 2001, the jury found Herzog guilty of first-degree murder in three killings, including Cindy Vanderheiden. Herzog was not given the death penalty, but instead got life in prison with the possibility of parole. I wanted Herzog to get the death penalty, and I was disappointed that he didn't get the death penalty, but... Uh, at least now he's, he's got a long time to go. He'll be an old man before he, he's eligible even for parole. Putting Wesley Shermantine and Lauren Herzog behind bars was a victory for prosecutors, but by no means a clear end to the story. Because of Herzog's confession, police suspect that their trail of victims was much longer. We've looked at a number of homicides, but there just isn't enough information, evidence, to identify them because they're the worst kind of serial killer. They are serial killers that will kill randomly, and those are the hardest ones to backtrack. The bodies of Cindy Vanderheiden and Chevy Wheeler still have not been found. It's hard because we can't bury our daughter. Uh, and, uh, I don't, you know, that's one thing that, that kills me. We have no place to uh, go or, or to see her. We don't know where she's at. She's in the bottom of a river. They say she's in a mine. He's even said she's in a shallow place, so we don't know where she's at. We don't know where to start looking. Where do you look? Until I bring her home and I put her in a resting place, I will never stop, never. I'll go to my grave looking for my sister.